Welcome to Chapter 31 of the Kinsman Die podcast, home of fantasy fiction based on Norse mythology that's written and read by me, Matt Bishop. In this podcast, I read my first novel, Kinsman Die, one chapter at a time. And as I mentioned in the last episode, I'm now providing mini recaps and semi-deep dives into the myths I've referenced in the text, rather than producing dedicated recap episodes every 10-ish chapters, as had been my original plan. As Al Swearingen said in Deadwood, announcing your plans is a good way to hear God laugh. Today, we're back with Vathrudnir. When we last were with him, he'd been talking with the Skrymir about a nefarious plot involving Loki. And in that chapter, the Skrymir ordered Vathrudnir to join the warband Helveg, which is where we find him now. Let's do this. Chapter 31. Vathrudnir. Vathrudnir leaned against the broad yew table. Opposite him, one of Helveg's scouts used a long stick to trace on the map the paths she'd taken. She tapped one spot, and he tilted his head to make sense of the map's markings. The only difficult part is this scrabble here, High Shaman, she said with the air of one who'd already said it once before. Viper and I made it up no problem, but we'll have to drop ropes down for the baggage and whatnot. Here Sir Belly looked a question at one of his captains. The man nodded. I checked here, sir. We have plenty of rope. Belly grunted and motioned for the scout to continue. After that, High Shaman, it's just a normal trek to the stone pillar, less than a night's march for the warband. Viper and I rode further, so near to where the glacier dropped off into the thund we could have dived off ourselves. And there was no route down, Belly said, reflexively, though he hadn't needed to. Vathrunir had already guessed the answer. Not only would the Skrymir have told him, but Helveg would have been up and nearly across the glacier by now, rather than idling here in camp. After more than a hundred winters of searching, he'd only ever found one safe way out of Utgard, the doorways. One of the keys to those doorways hung from Belly's broad belt. And this new doorway, well, possible doorway, was the real reason he was here. Dominating snow bears for Helveg's use in the coming conflict was all well and good, but the doorways meant life for the Jotun. He cleared his throat. <clears> throat> if I may, can you describe that pillar you rode past, Scout? She nodded, her long braids scattering shadows across the map. She picked up one of the small wooden discs that were piled before her, leaned forward, and placed it on the map. It was right about there, High Shaman. It's a long, low pile of rocks, higher at the southern end, which is how I approached it. How close did you get? Snow bears had extraordinary senses. We were downwind, so we got within probably two hundred yards. The nest was tucked right in close, so I, I can't say how many total snow bears are in the pack, but I saw the matron myself and counted four females, which meant there were probably several adult males as well. He could handle the matron, but the rest? That depended on how good Helvig's shamans were. Having met both, he was surprised that Shaman Stainfaster had survived as long as he had, but Adept Kali had potential, and it looked as if she hadn't quite decided on which faction within the shaman's ranks she would side with. So what do you think, Vathrudnir? Belly asked, the ruby-tipped pommel of the finder flashing in the witch lamp's glow. The snow bears won't be a problem, Hersir, he said, with more confidence than he felt, so long as we're disciplined about it. One of the advantages of his presumed old age was that he got to ride on a sled pulled by four young Jotun warriors. His fellow shamans, however, had to walk, or run as they were now, along with the rest of Helveg. As dawn approached, the crosswise stretch of the Bifrost above them faded, no longer a bridge of white-blue stars stretching from the southern end of the sky to the northern. Beyond the running figures of his bearers, the dark lump of rocks that was home to the pack of snow bears grew larger, the closer they got. He guessed they were a few hundred yards out, so any moment now, the hairseer would. A horn's sharp note cut through the tramp of feet upon glacier ice. A voice shouted, Helveg, walk! Once his sled had crunched to a halt, he stood, stretched, and thanked those who'd pulled him along. Westward, clouds clung to the mountain's shoulders. Hopefully the wind would pick up and draw that cloak over their heads. They were only risking being active in the daylight, because he had received definitive word that Goldtooth was indisposed, thanks yet again to Loki's clever bit of revenge. 
And the attack on Hulls had the other Asir looking everywhere except this scrap of glacier in remote northern Utgard. Otherwise, they would have had to wait for an obscuring storm or night's cloak. Not that they would have attacked a matron's pack during a storm. Without shamans present, a lone matron could have wiped out Helveg. And matrons were never, ever alone. How many are there? he asked his Fulgia. Just six so far, including the matron. So far? The nest goes down below the surface. Might be some down there also, Thimblethul said. All right, let me know if you find more. Just adults or pups, too. He raised a hand and waved Helveg's two shamans over to him. Kali jogged over at once, while Stainfoster made a point of taking his time. Both, he said to his Fulkia, but I'm not worried about the pups. There are at least five snow bears in that nest, he said to the shamans before him. The matron makes six. How can you know that? Stainfoster said. He ignored the question. Helveg's own scout had counted that many, which meant that the scout was very good indeed since his Fulgia hadn't found any others. Not yet, anyway. We will stand in the middle of Helvig's fighting square, so we can cover each wall as needed. Frost bears typically attacked in pairs, sometimes trios. Helvig's signal horn blew three quick, sharp notes. The rank of warriors closed into a large square of double rows around them. The warriors comprising the outside wall carried shields and axes. The warriors in the second row held spears, shields slung across their backs. One octomer stood behind each wall. They commanded the warriors in that wall. Helveg's officers, the Siglauter, Kjolar, and Hersir Belli himself, stood in the middle. As if in response, short howls that rasped like blades being honed issued from the nest of ice and stone. The snow bears were speaking to each other, no doubt coordinating their attack. The beasts were very smart, which is what made them so dangerous and so valuable once dominated. Once you have them dominated, Vothrinir said, make them sleep. A pack this size won't give us much time. And conserve your witch thread, he said pointedly, meeting his fellow shaman's eyes. Kali nodded agreement. Stainfoster didn't bother disguising his frown. Yes, what he'd said was obvious, but it bore the reminder. If any of them failed, the warriors protecting them would die. The dominations had to happen fast. Good. Head to your positions, Vathrenir said. They would be a triangle inside the warband's square, with him at the front. Hi, shaman. Are you ready, then? Hersir Belly called out, one hand on the finder dangling from his waist. Our quarry will test us shortly. We are, Hersir, he called back. The snow bears would indeed attack soon. That was why they hadn't bothered disguising their approach. It was safer to draw them out than confront them in their nest. Have you found her yet? he asked his Fulgia. More howls ripped through the air. An eddy of wind brought the stale reek of the nest to his nose. Yes. Let me guess. Those howls were because of you. The equivalent of a shrug flowed into his mind. She knows why you're here. This one's formidable. I doubt the other two shamans can handle her. Can I? Helvig's horn sounded a sharp note, and the fighting square moved forward toward the rocks and the nest. With my help... Yes. Well, folks, that was chapter 31 of Kinsmen Die. I hope you enjoyed it. We were with Vathrenir, High Shaman of the Oten, and he's also one of my favorite characters in Norse Myth. He and his fellow shaman, Stainfoster and Kali, along with the Jotun warband, Helveg, under the command of Hersir Belli, were in a remote northern part of Utgard, and they were about to dominate, whatever that means, we'll find out shortly, a pack of snow bears, whatever those are. But watch out, they spit, as Hoder well knows. First up this week, I will discuss the titles I created for the various warband ranks, Octomer, Kjolar, and Siglauter. When I was world-building the Asir and the Jotun military, I didn't want to use words like captain, lieutenant, or sergeant. Instead, I used terms from longships, Norse words that were used to describe the various parts of those ships, except for Hersir, which is a title used during the Viking Age to designate the leader of a group of warriors. So Hersir is the leader of a warband, or a vagar, and more about that in a minute. Kjolar means keel, and that's the captain of the warband. Siglauter means mast, and he is the equivalent of the lieutenant of the warband, so kind of second, second in command. The Octomer means brace, and he commands one wall of the four-sided shield wall. 
Belly, his name means bellower, and he is the hairseer, as I mentioned, of the war band called Helbeg. That word means the way to hell or the road to hell. And I thought that was kind of a cool name for a war band. They fight, kill enemies, and send them to hell. So the war band is the way to hell. And in Norse myth, a woman named Hel, H-E-L, rules the underworld. It's also called Helheim, and in some sources, Niflhel. Just to totally nerd out even further, in the World of Warcraft Legion X-Pack, you venture into Helheim, and they actually did a pretty good job of portraying it as being rocky, misty, wet, and cold, which is how the Norse viewed Helheim, which is only one of the regions of the dead in Norse mythology. Hel is one of Loki's daughters, by his first wife, I should mention, Angerboda, and more about her in a future episode. We also met Vathrunir's Fulgia again. Her name is Fimbulthul, and that name is one of the Elivegar, which are the eleven rivers that flow from Hvergilmir, which means the Roaring Cauldron, which I have placed at the center of the Ginnungagap. And if you're interested, I've just updated an old blog post on my site about the Elivegar, and I'll link to it in the description. But essentially, these rivers are, each have a name, which, according to Zemeck's dictionary, Snorri created that concept, those names for the various rivers. And all those rivers flow out from that central roaring cauldron, which I've kind of visualized as a kind of the vortex at the center of creation, essentially. And we'll see more of that come into play through the course of this book and then in the other books as well. Next week, we're back with Vidar Odinson as he tries to discover where the Jotun war band, the one that destroyed Halls, came from. Before then, if you have the time and the inclination, please take a few moments to rate or review the podcast. That provides valuable feedback for me and helps boost the show's visibility as to sharing it. And if you're so inclined, shoot me an email at mattbishopwrites at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. As always, I'm reading from the Havamal, Sayings of the High One, as translated by both Bellows and Larrington. We are nearing the end of the verses in which Odin provides advice about how to conduct oneself in a hall during feasts. Bellows, verse 31. Wise a guest holds it to take to his heels when mock of another he makes. But little he knows who laugh at the feast, though he mocks in the midst of his foes. Larrington, verse 31. Wise that man seems who retreats when one guest is insulting another. The man who mocks at a feast doesn't know for sure whether he shoots off his mouth amid enemies. Thanks for listening. <laughs>